And now, without further delay, the person who has the other half to this locket, Mr. Mark Spencer. Thank you, Alison. Just hang on for a minute, Mark. Okay. We've got a couple of other things to do first. Okay. But we do want you, for definite. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good, good. I'm very pleased, very pleased. Another great Astrocon. Got off to an excellent start yesterday. Had lots of interesting things going on. There's a few domestics that I'd like to tell you about. Have you heard about the dangerous demos? Yes. yes. You need to hear more about the dangerous demos. James, would you like to stand up for a moment? This is young James Bodie, a fellow Brit. The dangerous demos this year are the biggest and best they've ever been. They're sponsored by cloudonics.io. So thank you very much to the Cloudonix guys. And there's more prizes than there's ever been. And in honor of Sangoma and Digium coming together, and therefore the free PBX and Asterisk projects been under the same roof, there is a special prize for the best use of free PBX in the dangerous demos. How about that? Yay! It's amazing, isn't it? Amazing. OK, other things to tell you about. In fact, actually, can I do my little selfie now with our lovely lady photographer? There she is. We're just going to do a selfie. This one has special importance this time. This is a very important Astrocon tradition of a selfie, but this time I really want you to watch my back, and then I'll explain afterwards. It's not an, not an official selfie. That's great. Thank you very much. For that. Thanks a lot. Okay, so the reason I want you to watch my back was because you all got this piece of paper in your bag. This piece of paper is to do with the Ast request, and I've already had a couple of people come up to me today to talk about this. You will find a username, a password, and some other stuff to get you a connection. You will also see that the Astricon T-shirt, this is why I want you to watch, wanted you to watch my back, has some code on. That code will compile. So if you want to partake in the Ast request this year, that is uh, the start of it. It's not the end of it. It's actually, there's a bit of process involved. Uh, and and uh, if you get through, it says here that you could win a fabulous prize. Amazing stuff. Just back on the dangerous demos, we've got a tech check. Last year, there was a couple of technical issues. And so in this very room, between 10.30 and 12.30, there's a tech check for anybody that wants to check their laptop and what have you against the projector, et cetera, for the dangerous demos. And the last notice I would like to give you is regarding lunch. Lunch is at 12. It's in National Ballroom B, which is the same place we had lunch yesterday. Oh, and there's one more last thing. Then there's the happy hour, 4.30 to 6.30, and that's at the Trevi Bar, which is in the main lobby, down the stairs to the outside. So I hope I'll see you all there. With that said, I want to introduce the man, Mark Spencer. He's the reason we're all here. Give him a very, very big Astricon welcome. Thank you, David. Welcome to Astrocon, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out here. It's been uh, uh, quite an adventure, uh, both getting here and, uh, and it probably will be a little bit of an adventure getting back. So, um, but yeah, this is a, a really interesting time for me. So um, I, uh, I, I don't have any kids, but uh, I, I used to be one, so I think I can I can speak towards what it must be like to have kids. Uh, but I feel like having uh, a company and having a project, Asterisk and Digium, are sort of the closest thing to kids that I've had. And when I started these out, I was really focused on wanting to have them be what I sort of envisioned they would be going forward. And as more people got involved uh, in you know, the company and the project, they start to take on life of their own and start to take on a personality of their own. Um, and so you start interacting with them differently. So, I, you know, I look at, uh, at Digium as something that I started and it's grown, it's got a personality of its own, it's been influenced by all kinds of really important people along the way. And now we've come to the spot that Digium is getting married, basically. And Digium's getting married off, and it's going to have a family of its own. And I'm still going to be very interested, and I do plan to come and attend AstroCon each year. 
and uh, follow up and see how things are going. But this, uh, this marriage has been a long way coming. Uh, these, um, some of you may not know, but the original, the very first Astro system I built, of course, there were no Digim cards back then. So it was built using a Sangoma wine, wind pipe connected up to some Adtran gear to uh, be able to just get calls in and out of the system. So these companies have uh, definitely grown up together quite a bit. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Bill Wignall, the new CEO of Sangoma, or I guess the new, the new CEO of, of Digium, and he has been the CEO of uh, Sangoma. And I will also uh, be heading out of here basically immediately to try to avoid this giant hurricane that's coming. So uh, we'll see you guys <laughs> next year. Give me a hug. Well right. done. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Is my uh, mic on okay? Yeah? Okay, so um, I was told I got like 10 minutes up here because by the time uh, the merging of Sangoma and Digium was announced, the agenda for this event was locked down uh, long ago. So here's what you're going to get uh, from me for the next few minutes. I do want you to know that, you know, without you guys, there is no asterisk. The community matters immensely to us. And since we won't have time for questions here today, I would like you to know that all of us from Digium and Sangoma would be thrilled to meet you. Find us during the course of the next few days. Come and say hi. We're good people. I'm a nice guy. I'd like to say hello. Uh, come up and uh, tell us what you do with Asterisk. So here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I don't know, two years or maybe three years ago, I was asked to give a keynote at Astracon. And uh, Sangoma had just acquired free PBX at the time. And there was, I don't know, maybe concerns overstated. There was a little bit of worry about given what had happened in the open source industry with other projects historically, how committed was Sangoma to the open source world? And I gave this big long talk about how Sangoma had grown up and changed and how change works in tech companies. And at the end, I get this question from someone saying, yeah, that was a great talk. Thanks for the fancy uh, PowerPoint slides. I don't quite believe it. I don't think you're committed to open source. So that's how it all kind of worked. Is the person who asked me that question here by chance? I was kind of hoping to meet you. No? OK. You're probably not brave enough. If you are, come find me. Um, so I, I said, like, we, we are all in. Sangoma has roots in open source. Uh, we're committed to it. We understand it. It's one of the backbones of our company's success and growth. And there was still a little bit of reluctance even after my answer. And all I wanted to say now is, OK? So we are fully in. The most important message I want you to hear from me today is um, Sangoma is completely committed to asterisk. Uh, Sangoma and Digium together value not just the project, but you guys uh, incredibly. We have a very large team of people working on Asterisk. I'm going to talk a little bit about Sangoma over the next couple of slides. And as I said at the last um, uh, keynote that I did here a couple of years ago, it was a talk about change and how nothing stays the same, everything's changing. Sangoma has changed a lot over the last few years. When I came in to take over the reins at Sangoma, uh, one of the first trips I made was down to Huntsville, Alabama to meet with Digium. It was clear to me that those companies belonged together right from the beginning. Timing wasn't right then. A few years later, as Mark has just said, it's made sense to put the companies together. As we merged those businesses, Sangoma has gone from $10 million to $100 million in sales. We're now one of the most significant players in the industry. We're completely committed to both Asterisk and free PBX. Um, we take the responsibility as stewards of those projects super seriously. Uh, we are the primary developers of both. We spend millions of dollars per year developing them. Um, and we're still all in. We take that responsibility to be stewards of Asterisk very seriously. And I want you to know that we see a lot of benefits 
to you guys as the community as we merge together Digium and Sangoma. The company itself is now a very impressive organization. And you might ask, why is Bill Wignall telling me that? Why do I care as an asterisk user? You probably should care is our hypothesis. You want the project coming from an organization that has the resources and commitment to invest in it, to continue to evolve the project, to support it. Sangoma is now, as I said, $100 million in revenue between 300 and 400 people all over the world. Right? We have staff in, I don't know, half of the US states, in Canada, Colombia, Ecuador, the UK, France, Spain, Belgium, Italy, India, Hong Kong, you get it, right? Uh, Sangoma is a serious player, and you now have that kind of a company behind the project that you care about. So you have longevity and stability and commitment. There's, I don't know, 150, between 150 and 200 engineers writing code each and every day inside this company trying to make the project better for you guys. Okay, so, so that's kind of it from me. I want you to know that a lot of people at Sangoma and Digium put a lot of work into organizing this event on your behalf. Thank you to our team for doing that. Uh, thank you so much to our sponsors, uh, without which this kind of event is not possible. Uh, I hope you have a great AstroCon. Please enjoy it. Come say hi. Find us. Um, we'll be on the floor uh, milling around. I have cards with me. If you don't find me and find someone else from Digimer Sangoma, ask for my contact information. I'm very happy to talk to you. And uh, without further ado, where's Simon? Simon Woodhead, please come up. Simon's from Simwood. He's going to do our keynote uh, talking about privacy. Nice to see you, man. Thanks, Bill. Do you need this at all? Slides? No, I've, I've no? got my own clicker up here if it's still here. Okay, good, good. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. This is a, a unique privilege for me and probably one that won't be, won't be repeated. So I'm really touched and, and humbled to be, to be here speaking to you all. I'm going to talk today about privacy, or privacy, as we call it in the UK, um, because I think there's something wrong. There's something wrong with big technology. I think we all know it. I want to explore what might be, what could be wrong, show off a few toys, and then look at what we can do as a community and what we can all do as an industry to hopefully make things, things better. If my clicker works. OK. So I'm going to articulate the problem and talk about some solutions. But first, I want to detour into a little bit of biology. The human heart pumps blood through our veins and arteries from before we're born to the moment we die. It's the most efficient pump ever known to man. But there's two other aspects of it that I'd like to look at. Firstly, it's the seat of love and compassion. And I want to take this uniquely privileged opportunity to say I love this community. I hate being away from home. I stay in enough hotels in a year that I don't crave the travel. But I come to these events, and I'm spending time with friends. Some of the most selfless, giving, open-hearted people I know are in this room and certainly in this community. So I want to take this opportunity to just say thank you. Thank you for everything you've created. Thank you for everything you've enabled me to build with Simwood. And thank you for everything you've enabled me to become. Because the reality is I go home from events like this feeling, feeling nourished. The second thing, whoops, second thing is the, there's an organization called HeartMath that did some research on the heart some years ago. And they strapped uh, participants up with brain and heart sensors. And they measured the brain activity versus heart activity in certain, certain situations. They showed them a, a blank screen, asked them to push a button, and then they displayed them a randomly selected image. Some of the images were high arousal, and some of the images were low arousal. And then they saw a blank screen again, and they were asked to push the button, and the cycle repeated, and it went around 30 or so times. 
And this experiment was repeated subsequently around many labs around the world. And the results were quite astounding. What they noticed was about five seconds before an image was displayed, the heart rate would decelerate. But what was more interesting was that the heart rate would decelerate more if the image was high arousal. So the heart appeared to be exhibiting some kind of, um, to be tapping into some kind of intuition beyond the, the bounds of, of space and time, um, which I find quite, quite fascinating. Um, this has gone on to be a whole field in itself called neurocardiology, where the heart is considered to be a little brain um, capable of learning, um, capable of decision making, and we know that there's far more signaling from the, the heart to the brain than the other way around. And we know that we feel things in our heart first, then in our head, and then when we get this, this, this feeling in our gut, that's actually the third stage of, of, of conscious thought. And so the heart exhibits this kind of intelligence um, and this, this precognition, if you like. And that leads me on to privacy, that I think if we're honest with ourselves, we know there's something not quite right, but we can't quite put our fingers on it. How can the biggest or some of the biggest highest revenue companies in the world be giving away their service for free? Now, we know there's advertising, but there's, there's a, there's a trade-off there that doesn't quite make sense to us. I'm old enough to remember when business was simple. If I wanted a lump of meat, or a cut of meat, I guess, I'd, I'd go to the butchers. I'd say, can I have some meat, please? He'd say, yes, can I have some money? I'd give him my hard-earned wages, and I'd go away. He'd have my money. I'd have some meat. We're all happy. It was a one-dimensional transaction. But things aren't like that anymore. Being advertising-funded is at least a consideration for a, for a startup. And those that fund stroke direct startups, particularly in the technology space, have cottoned on to the blindingly obvious fact that if you give your service away for free, the take-up of it is going to be far higher than if you were charging for it. Imagine Google on a paper search model. So the service has a good uptake of users, and that creates a steady supply of what I would suggest is the actual product, which is those users, or more specifically, the data from those users, which can then be sold to advertisers. And the transaction is more complicated than that, because when those users interact with those advertisers, there's a further flow of data and probably a further flow of money. It's very complicated, but boiling it right down, the user is getting this service, pictures of, pictures of their friend's dinner and cat videos for free, and in return, they're giving their user data. And we all need to be aware of that trade-off. And my real point to you guys today is that I don't think we are. And maybe we more are in this room, but I think certainly if I speak to my granny or my old auntie, Google is free, Facebook is free. She doesn't appreciate what she's giving of herself in order to get it and we need to. There are those that say, oh, Google knows everything about me anyway, or I have nothing to hide. I would suggest we all have something to hide. We all have curtains in our home. I think if I asked you to email me a list of all your passwords, some saucy pictures of your partner, and maybe a bit of background information on that rash you've been getting treated, I can't imagine there would be any takers particularly if I was then going to put it up on a website to share with everybody and keep it for, I don't know, forever, just in case it was, it was useful. And then, of course, there's the leadership in this space and, and their attitude to privacy. Eric Schmidt is Google's CEO. If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Okay. So we can see where that's going. Now... If you want to run an advertising-funded model, if you want to collect user data, you need a massive database. Now, this isn't a database in the form that we all think. It isn't a relational database like MySQL or, or Postgres. It's called a graph database. Um, not graph as in pie chart or line chart, but graph in terms of associations between objects. And it's really simple. And from its simplicity comes the ability to have massive, massive scale and massive, massive queryability, because fundamentally you're, you're taking two objects, 
In our scenario, what, we're looking at a graph database, so one of those objects is you, the user. Another object could be, for example, Astrocon, or this hotel, or Orlando, or the person sitting next to you. And then we're taking a link between the two. So Dan attended Astrocon. Fred loves Yenny. Um, and there's millions and millions of these links to objects going into these databases for, for each of us. And I put it to you, there's, there's two massive ones that we populate every day, inadvertently or consciously, specifically Google and Facebook. But there are dozens of others from second tier, second tier startups, all trying, to, all trying to achieve the same. And we populate these things just through our everyday usage of these, these free services. But they're populated in other ways as well, from each other's usage of these, these free services. Um, I saw something recently where uh, Facebook was enabling advertisers to target people based on phone numbers that they'd never given Facebook, but phone numbers that were provided to them in other people's contact lists. So if I have a phone number that only you have, and you upload that contact list to Facebook, that becomes a link to me for the purposes of, of targeting advertising. And then there's facial recognition. Um, since 2010, we've been able to tag photos on, on Facebook. Um, people have been training the algorithm since 2010. In 2014, they announced that DeepFace, which is the project uh, involved with this, could get near human levels of facial recognition. Without a photo being tagged, it could identify people in, in photos. Uh, DeepFace could achieve 97.25%. A human that had met the person could achieve 97.5%. That was four years ago. AI has come a long way, and Facebook only had 1.2 billion users then. It's got twice as many training it now. Now, there's those of you that would say, oh, yeah, but I use stealth mode in my browser, or I clear my cookies, they're not tracking me. Well, we need to get away from this naive thinking that everything hangs on a cookie. Cookies, when we developed web apps 10 years ago, cookie was set, user's logged in. Cookie isn't set, user isn't logged in. But nowadays, for the purposes of tracking, there are many, many, many fingerprints around all of us that enable us to be identified. And a cookie may be part of it, but it's, it's, it's a very, very tiny piece. There's a technique called canvas fingerprinting, um, whereby unique aspects of the browser, such as version, fonts, plugins installed like Flash, are all effectively fingerprinted. And that enables a unique fingerprint representing you, usually pretty close to 100% unique, to be, to be determined. You add in other factors, other metadata, such as geolocation, IP address, albeit transitory, other plugins like content blockers, and you can sure as damn it get to 100% unique, um, a unique fingerprint for somebody. And this is somebody in stealth mode with their cookies turned off. Uh, WebRTC can be a part of this, of course, because with WebRTC, you can interrogate the devices that are available. You can get a unique fingerprint for each device that is available to, to the browser. So let's not assume we're not tracked. We're tracked. That's, that's, that's reality. But what are they tracking? It's only metadata. Well, this is a meme our government back in the UK have been trying to ram down people's throats for the best part of three years as they've been trying to um, ram through, which they have now successfully done what we call Snoopers Charter. They're collecting metadata, and it's only metadata. It doesn't matter. Mr. Zuckerberg, would you be comfortable sharing with us the name of the hotel you stayed in last night? Um, uh, no. If you messaged anybody this week, would you share with us the names of the people you've messaged? Uh, Senator, no, I would probably not choose to do that publicly here. I think that may be what this is all about. That's exactly what this is about. That is only metadata. Nobody cares what he did in his hotel room. Nobody cares what was in the message that he sent to whoever it was that he sent. What matters, what is relevant and easy to store in a graph database is his relationship with that hotel at that time. His relationship with the person that he messaged. Don't know why that's flickering. There's a, there's a great website, links, links at the bottom there, that attempts to debunk some of these things with a number of scenarios where, through metadata alone, you can build up a very, very clear picture of a scenario. And it's well worth, well worth having a look. Now, if you are the destination for something like 80% of eyeballs on the internet, 
and you have your like buttons and your free analytics service that third-party websites are, are going are to feed you data through, you might be, still be dissatisfied that you're only getting something like 90% representation of, of internet usage. You might want more data. So what could you do? Well, you could offer a free DNS service. Um, now, that would create, generate some quite useful uh, metadata, albeit limited in its ability to be linked to people, but they're working on that. But really what you want to do is you want to get something on the desktop. If you can install software on the desktop, you're no longer operating within the bounds of this browser that constrains what you can access. You've got full access to that device with the privileges of the user that installed it. Now, this is all hypothetical, of course. It doesn't have to be a browser. It could be an instant messaging client, for example, or a tool to sync photos. There's all manner of things, but the, the key requirements are it's installed on the, on the device, and it has a login to your service. Because that login gives you two things. One, it gives you a link between that device and that user, such that any metadata can be immediately linked. And two, let's say it's syncing bookmarks or exchanging messages. There is an expectation that there will be an encrypted channel between that piece of software and your, your service. A cynic might say that encrypted channel could also carry other things, such as metadata. Um, a cynic might say that, that that could scan the file system, perhaps, and collect metadata on, on the machine. It could also scan the network and determine devices that are, that are around. And it could also further inspect the hardware to get further fingerprinting. That browser could even enable people to, um, to extend it with very helpful tools that could further violate their privacy. And it could even be extended with plugins that could violate their privacy cross-platform. So this is a plugin for Google Pro Chrome that exploits a vulnerability in Facebook's Tinder API so that you can really usefully not only see all of your friends that are on Tinder, but you can get a moving map of where they all are at any, point, any one time. It's not right. Now, if you were frankly cheeky, and you were on 75% of desktops, you could get on your white horse, and you could champion a secure web. Now, don't get me wrong, the content of that, the secure web, crypto everywhere, I fully support. But a cynic might say that that could generate some fairly racy headlines such as, such as this one. But let's look at it. The browser vendor, for want of a better word, is giving up precisely zero. Because the browser, in any secure web session, the browser is in control of the key. The browser is encrypting everything going from the device up to the server and everything coming back again. They're not, sat they're not sacrificing any data to give you a secure um, web experience. In fact, what they're actually doing is preventing any competitors gathering metadata along the way. Now, don't get me wrong, I support it. It's a good thing, but let's be realistic about the sacrifice that they're making, or rather, not making. And people might say they're evil. There's all sorts of videos about how evil Facebook is, and you know, conspiracy theories about why Google's dropped the don't be evil from its, from its mission statement. But, but actually, they're quite honest. If you read the privacy policies, they say exactly what they're going to be doing to you. This is an extract from, from Google's, where they talk about the fact that they're going to examine the network in the environment around, the, around your device to determine certain things about you. And they're going to take data from your sensors. Now, sensors is a deliciously vague word. Sensor, to me, says accelerometer or potentiometer. That could be useful. You know, data, am I looking at this web page laid down in bed, or am I looking at this web page sat next to my partner? That creates a very different set of um, distinction between, between metadata. But is a camera not, met not a sensor? Is a microphone not a sensor? Is anything we could conceive that could intrude our privacy not a sensor? They've said here in plain, in plain sight. So with that, I've talked about sniffing networks around you and using it to identify other devices. 
but it's probably time to introduce you to some toys. So up here, I am, apologies to those of you whose batteries haven't lasted terribly well the last couple of days, that might be me, it'll be fine after this talk. I'm scanning uh, wireless on 2.4 and 5 bands, and we're scanning Bluetooth. Um, now, Bluetooth is really secure. It, uh, it hops frequency something like 800 times a second, and the sequence and timing of those hops are only known to the two devices that are paired. And unlike Wi-Fi, it has no, has no monitor mode, so snooping Bluetooth is really, really hard. Or at least was, until this little bad boy came along. This is called an Ubertooth, and it's basically software-defined radio that gives you essentially monitor mode for Bluetooth. So with that, I can suck all of the full packet capture of all of the Bluetooth activity in the room. Um, now, that is Bluetooth activity from active devices. So if you're discoverable, you're there. And it was shocking last night how many devices were just discoverable all the time. But most smartphones aren't discoverable permanently now. But if your phone is talking to your watch or your Fitbit is uploading your, your latest heart rate stats, because that's really important, then your device will be active, and this, this will get it. But actually, I'm not using that, because I discovered, after weeks of messing about with that, trying to identify devices, a really, really easy way to wake devices up if I needed to. Now, just on Bluetooth, before we, I don't click on, before we leave it, um, on Ethernet and on Wi-Fi, we, we're familiar with a MAC address, unique um, address of the, the network card. On Bluetooth, we don't have quite the same thing, um, but it ends up in the same place. On Bluetooth, you have this thing called the lower address part, which is part of what we consider a MAC address. And that is transmitted in every Bluetooth packet. Now, for our tracking purposes, there's only 16.7 million of them, so there's not enough entropy for that to be useful. And this also explains why if you've bought a Bluetooth device and it just doesn't work with one of your other devices, you could be getting a collision of these things. But if actually we can sniff sufficient packets, we can actually determine the other address parts. And we end up in a place where we've got what looks very much like a MAC address, the, blue, the Bluetooth equivalent of a MAC address. Now, I've talked about Bluetooth being, being secure. That's classic Bluetooth. Bluetooth Low Energy, the, the latest version, is a whole different kettle of fish. Um, the, the standard has the equivalent of a great big fix me in it, in the section on encryption. And therefore, many people deploying BTLE devices don't bother, um, or they roll their own. So they're encrypting the payload rather than at a, at a higher level like you might see with, um, with classic Bluetooth. So none of this is necessary with BTLE. You can do it from a Raspberry Pi or the Bluetooth adapter built into your, built into your device. See all of the devices around you. And there's all sorts of challenges coming down the line from this, because BTLE seems to be in everything. If you're making a device and you want to give it Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, they come on the same chip nowadays, and if you make the massive volume commitment of 20 units, that chip will cost you 80 cents. So you can imagine if you're producing a few hundred thousand or a few million devices, you're talking pence to put that additional chip in. And what you might find is that because they come on the same chip, you'll get devices that are built with Bluetooth support that have Wi-Fi because somebody's forgotten to turn it off, and vice versa. But of more interest to me and for what we're talking about today, there are, because they're on the same chip, there is a direct relationship between the MAC address, the equivalent of the MAC address on Bluetooth, and the MAC address on the Wi-Fi. So if I can track you on Bluetooth, I can track you on Wi-Fi, and vice versa. Now, if you're not content with just access to somebody's computer, you've exploded out the browser, you've got onto the, onto the device, but really, you're then constrained by the physical hardware, and you want more data. What you need to do is make your own hardware. And I put it to you, it'd be relatively easy to include another one of these couple of cent chips in one of these devices, and you could justify that quite easily, hypothetically. Um, and then you've got this device that people will put in their most intimate spaces that's full of sensors um, that can also do various other things in terms of inspecting the, the RF environment. 
And people will pay you money, by the way, for this. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to what I call the astrocuter, which is, rather than tracking, it's a more, more f fun um, way of looking at this in the terms of targeted executions of certain, certain members of the, of the community. So I don't, I don't have the privilege of having a browser on 75% of their desktops, and they haven't paid me any money to put a listening device by the side of their bed. So I've had to get certain metadata about them by social engineering over the last couple of days. And some were tricky, but you'd be surprised generally how compliant people were. So what we've got. So we're tracking, we're tracking Bluetooth, Wi-Fi across the two, the two bands, and I'm logging here. I haven't started the actual assassination script yet, but this is a, because this is Astrocom, we've made this scalable, right? So every, I've got three probes running there, and they're all VMs. They could be individual, uh, individual installs on Raspberry Pis. In fact, I did consider a drone with a probe sort of at either side so we could get directional control for assassination purposes based on signal strength. Um, all of those are feeding into Redis, so we've got maximum scalability, because we might want thousands of these probes. And again, because this is Astrocon, the UI is WebRTC into Asterisk 16. So the idea is all of these probes are feeding into the database. When I start the tracking script here, we should see something happening on the, on the WebRTC side find where I am. I oh, you love demos. What idiot would do a demo during a keynote? Staff is secure. All right, let's start this again. Astrocuter. Turn that down a bit. Scanning for geeks. Two, six, one. Devices detected. Scanning for victims. David Duffett detected. Aw, he's so nice. I will not do it. Got that one quite quick. I was bricking myself last night. It took 30 seconds to get one. Okay, yeah, I'm on the wrong screen there. There we are. Are you going to get anybody else? James Boat oh. detected. Check out my dangerous demo, sucker. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that running in the background just in case. But so where were we? Oh yeah, you've got this listening device. Dan by the Jenkins detected. Oh, look at those chubby little cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've got this listening device by the side of your bed, right? Um, that's full of full of sensors. Let's not go into the other weird shit that those things are reported to do. Certainly, anecdotally, the evidence for them doing naughty things is, is huge. Academically, um, it, it hasn't been corroborated yet, but you look at the patents that have been filed James for this. James Bodie detected. Check out my dangerous demos. Let's stop that. <laughs> um, you look at the patents that have been filed, and it's kind of, kind of scary where they're going with this. And those of us that have had the sense not to buy one of these, can't really escape them now, because if our neighbors got one and they're able to suck in all of the Wi-Fi in the, in the vicinity, regardless of what network it's on, such as, such as that is, um, we're caught anyway by virtue of living next door. We go and stay in a hotel. They're talking about putting them in the hotel. Um, what use a freaking voice assistant is in a toilet, I do not know, um, unless number and frequency of bowel movements um, is useful metadata. Perhaps it is. But it goes beyond that. If you've got a device in your home that is permanently listening, and they are permanently listening, they may say they're not permanently recording, but they have to be permanently listening in order to pick up the Hey Alexa, Hey Google keywords, or whatever they're called. Um, 
they can listen to other things. So let's say your business is advertising and you want to play a TV advert, but you want to put a, a high frequency signature at the end of that advert that's imperceptible to the human ear, but can be picked up by this device in the home that can register that user, you can see is there from his, um, his signature, um, has heard this advert. That's kind of useful. Next time he goes online, you can serve him up an online version of that advert, and they tell me if you see two adverts, that enhances the, the likelihood of you making a purchase. Mobile. Um, I'm not going to go there, um, because it's too depressing, and to be honest, it's, it's a whole subject in itself. But suffice to say, take everything I've said about your digital signature and tracking and audio and sensors and put it in your pocket, going everywhere. Put a, put a computer in your pocket and take it everywhere with additional wireless, um, wireless features. You know, N NFC, it's got Bluetooth, it's got wireless, um, it's got a camera, it's got audio. Um, that's a whole separate talk on its own. But I think Bluetooth is going to be in the news a lot more over the coming, over the coming years, because I mentioned that it was quite hard to hack, and so people kind of gave up about five years ago. There was a few, few Bluetooth-specific hacks that were out there five years ago, but people kind of, kind of lost interest. BTLE is a whole different kettle of fish, and we're already starting to see replay attacks and various other things for simple things like light bulbs. But these Muppets seem to be putting Bluetooth in everything, um, including, as you saw earlier, um, heart sensors and, sorry, pacemakers and pill bottles. So I joke with the astrocuter about targeted assassination, but the prospect of assassinating somebody from 12 feet away with a laptop over Bluetooth is entirely realistic. Now, don't believe me. I'm an idiot. Um, this is academic um, university research into the data that... It, I want to use the word leaked, but the, the data that is sent to Google by Chrome and by Android, clean install of, clean install of Android. It's quite a long read, but it's well worth doing to, to bring yourself kind of fully up to speed with the, the extent of this, this stuff. So are you willing to change your business model in the interest of protecting individual privacy? Congresswoman, I'm not sure what that means. And again, isn't that the point? These guys, as long as we keep giving them data, they're going to keep taking it. And they're going to keep wanting more. And they're going to keep encroaching on further, further aspects of our life. Now, if you start looking into this, as I hope you will after this talk, um, you'll come across this phrase, species-level behavioral modification. And I'd like to play you uh, two minutes of a 10-minute video that Google disavow. Um, although at the end of it says for internal Google use only, um, which, whether it's real or not, whether it's Google's strategy or whether it's an internal product pitch, is, is frankly irrelevant. But listen to the content and the wording and just think in terms of potential. If you've got this database for several billion people over 15 years, what you could do with that. Since the 1970s, huge efforts have been made in sequencing the human genome. Today, after many years of research and billions of data points, that sequence is known. By adopting a similar perspective with user data, we may begin to better understand its role. Just as the examination of protein structures paved the way to genetic sequencing, the mass multi-generational examination of actions and results could introduce a model of behavioral sequencing. As gene sequencing yields a comprehensive map of human biology, researchers are increasingly able to target parts of the sequence and modify them in order to achieve a desired result. As patterns begin to emerge in the behavioral sequences, they too may be targeted. The ledger could be given a focus, shifting it from a system which not only tracks our behavior, but offers direction towards a desired result. We are at the very beginning of our journey of understanding in the field of user data. By applying our knowledge of epigenetics, inheritance, and memetics to this field, we may be able to make mental leaps in our understanding 
which could offer benefits to this generation, to future generations, and the species as a whole. You guys got midterms in a month or so. Um, keep all this in mind when you read your personalized news feed or you look at comments from your personalized timeline. Both of the entities providing that personalized view of the world selling advertising, knowing your every move, knowing your political inclinations, and even frankly knowing if you've been to vote. Looking forward, I can see a couple of other, other scary directions this, this could go in if, if multi-generational species or whole species multi-generational behavioral modification isn't scary enough. Um, Facebook is considered to be nearing ubiquity. All we need is some Muppet in central government to decide that Facebook should be a single sign-on to, to government services and therefore mandate, requirement, uh, mandate usage of it. Facebook also has um, what they call their internal trust score, which is a commendable attempt to weed out trolls. But could that also in time be considered some kind of internet credit reference? Your score as an internet citizen. And if they were working with the banks, as the article suggests they might be, could your internet tangibility somehow affect your ability to procure services? Maybe specifically internet services, maybe the ability to open a bank account. I can't see any of this heading in a positive direction. We get this free stuff, but we're giving up so much for it. So I've probably depressed you enough. Um, the question then is, what do we do about it? Well, every single one of you in this room, I expect, is the source of advice to friends and loved ones on technology things. I'm speaking to you guys because you're the early adopters of the early adopters. We need to educate people. There's dozens of links in these slides, and I'll work with, with David to, to try and make them, make them available for you. But they were collected relatively easily over the last month. There's a fire hose of this kind of news flow, ignoring like, the big one from Google yesterday and the big one from Facebook a month or so ago. There's, there's a continual flow of these things once you're aware of them. And your loved ones don't know that for the sake of seeing a cat picture or a picture of somebody's dinner, they are giving up so much of themselves. And they don't know that in giving up so much of themselves, they're affecting you. And they don't know that everything we're collectively giving up is affecting our children. Now, I hate bringing children to it because it makes me sound like the flipping government, but that's the reality of the situation. Everything we're doing today, all of the training today, is affecting subsequent generations. And we need to act. We need to get our own house in order. Um, as, a, as a project and as a community, there's a lot more we can do to make sure we don't know what we don't need to know. And I'm talking here about encryption of config files, particularly user directories, that kind of thing. I'll bang the drum that I seem to bang every time I get on a, get on a stage about encryption of, of SIP and RTP. WebRTC has, frankly, you know, whipped our ass in, in, in that respect, and that's good. I commend everybody involved in it. But the rest of us that are doing conventional SIP really need to get our house in order, because users expect their voice to be private. They expect it to be encrypted. They don't expect to be wanging their conversations unencrypted over the airwaves for some muppet like me to take a packet capture of. But we also need to change our behavior. We need to stop feeding them, because I think, as you saw, they're not going to change their business model if this data keeps on coming. They're just going to pursue more of it, because that's what they're selling. They've got free supply of what they sell. We need to change our behavior. And I'm going to run very quickly, because I'm conscious of time, through some open source and commercial with open source of their code projects that, that I use in, in, in my life and feel like a move in the right direction. Signal, um, these guys are awesome. Um, the Signal Messenger is the only IM client I use now. And I know I've moved some of you, some of you onto it. Um, there's a link to their blog at the bottom there, which as an engineer is frankly semi-arousing. Um, that's... That's a blog post about how they do content discovery whilst knowing nothing 
at every stage of its flow through software and hardware and even within the hardware. It, it's crazy the lengths they go to to know nothing. Now contrast that and be very careful with the likes of WhatsApp that will say they use the signal pro protocol for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging if you turn it on. Remember, they're not particularly interested in the content. That's the bit that's encrypted. They're interested in the metadata, and they've still got the metadata. Ditch it, move to signal. What's going on? Oh, there we go. Um, DuckDuckGo, privacy aware search engine. Um, frankly, it used to be rubbish, but I'm really pleased that it's thrived. And I've been using it for 12 months or so, and it is a perfectly capable alternative to, to Google for untracked search. Um, interestingly, I don't know if you saw this, this little snippet, Google's paying 16 billion, um, and that's sterling, so it's even more in dollars, what's that, 20, 20 billion dollars, um, to be the default search engine on iOS. That's broadly $10 or 10 pounds per device per, per year. And that's just for the opportunity to be the default search engine, because of course you can change it. Uh, Brave, you might have seen from some of my screenshots, don't use Chrome. Chrome is built on Chromium. Um, Chromium is the open source uh, browser engine, admittedly sponsored by, by Google. Chrome is Chromium plus the Google specific stuff. Brave is Chromium plus some privacy specific stuff. Um, now there's moves afoot to de-Google even Chromium, which are commendable, but in the interim, Brave is, is, a, great, is a great option. It, it detects and strips out um, canvas fingerprinting. It strips out various sort of flavors of cookies, sort of first domain cookies, third party cookies. Uh, strips out ads, strips out all sorts of tracking, and you can tweak the settings on a per domain basis and it will remember them for when you go back. Um, it's tremendous. Um, home automation. I've tried most of the commercial products and they're generally incomplete or rubbish. Home Assistant, install it on a Raspberry Pi and it'll solve all of you all of your problems. Those cameras in your children's bedroom really don't need to be streaming video via the cloud. You could just keep it local. Pie hole, DNS, black holing for the whole network, for your home or for your office, strip out ads, strip out tracking at the network level. And this is commercial, but they open source the code, and they're also custodians of um, OpenPGP.js. PGP is great but it's a pain in the bum to use, particularly on mobile devices and things. Um, Proton does it transparently, so even your granny can use it, so as an alternative for friends and family to, say, Google, that is great. Now, you know I haven't said delete your social media, because, frankly, I don't think you'd listen to me. Um, I haven't been on Facebook for many years, and I think my life is better as a result, but it's not to say that's not without price. Um, one of my mates committed suicide. I didn't know he had committed suicide. I didn't know the warning signs because I'm not on Facebook. And I've got many, many, many instances, many stories um, like that. But like I say, I, that's a price I'm willing to pay. We all need to make a decision. It's not for me to tell you black and white, you shouldn't do this or you should do something else. We all need to make a decision where on that scale we want to sit. How much of this free stuff we want and how much of ourselves and our loved ones are we giving up in return to get it? And you may, de you may decide you don't care, you're going to give everything because you want free cat pictures. Or you may, after today, just, just want to tweak that, that equation slightly and start to protect your user data a little bit more. That brings me to the end of my, my talk. Mr. Duffett will be relieved to hear. Um, I hope you have a fantastic um, Astrocon. If it's your first time, everyone here is really, really friendly. But if you're the sort that doesn't like talking to strangers, Hopefully I'm less of one after 45 minutes or so, so come find me. I'm more than happy to buy you a beer. Um, similarly, if there's any questions, come and find me in the bar, and you, you might spot a theme there. Thank you very much. <laughs>because we've got to get to the sessions, and the content is excellent. I already saw somebody tweet yesterday that they wish they could be in two places as well.